We initially wanted to determine if any other law enforcement officers that held the badge were involved in criminal activities. He approached me. He expressed to me that these were diamonds that we were guarding. He just told me that I would be responsible for security. At some point, I realized that Keith was not telling me some things. Everybody wants to do the right thing, but everybody does it. What do you think you're doing? What did he tell you you were protecting? I said, man, are you really serious? I bought a 12-gauge pistol grip shotgun. If he decides to do something, am I going to try to wrestle him for his gun? Wow, it's not worth it. This is not worth it. It was a drug sting with police officers. And I heard that knock on the door. I knew it could be nothing good. Over one dozen police officers will soon be facing federal indictments. This was the worst case of police corruption ever. The cops were charged with stealing over $1 million in taxpayer funds. I went from putting handcuffs on people to having handcuffs put on me. Savannah, Georgia is a beautiful city with a troubled past. Ghosts of enslaved people haunt these historic streets and graveyards and provide a backdrop of persistent inequality that hangs in the air like Spanish moss. In the 1990s, Savannah is trying to modernize, growing its ports into one of the busiest commercial shipping hubs on the East Coast. But with more money, comes more problems. My name is Reverend Dr. Leonard Small. I'm the pastor of the Litwe Missionary Baptist Church. I've been the pastor here for the last 38 years. We're talking 1990s. Savannah's still behind the eight ball. Getting from A to B in terms of upward mobility was extremely hard. And crack cocaine was an epidemic that just blew up in Savannah. The 1990s sees America's war on drugs heat up. This was the time when they were passing these draconian minimum sentences laws. Even President Biden has since um, repented of. We increase the penalties. In that climate, it was lock them up and throw away the key. My name is Anthony Bryan. I was born and raised here in Savannah, Georgia. We stayed in a four bedroom, two bath apartment with eight siblings. And life was just so simple back then. We didn't know at that time that we were poor. My oldest brother, Tommy, was more not just a big brother to me, but somebody I admired and looked up to. And so when Tommy got involved in law enforcement, kind of followed him along. Anthony Bryant has always looked up to his brother, Tommy, and has followed in his footsteps. Both serve in the military overseas and share a deep brotherly bond. Eventually, Tommy begins working as a police officer in Savannah, while Anthony gets a job in the sheriff's office right outside of Savannah. And that's where he makes his way up the ranks. I became a corrections officer back in 92 with the Chino County Sheriff's Department, then a deputy sheriff, and then eventually uh, I received a job as a Chino County Police officer and that was in 1995. I loved the idea of keeping people safe. I loved the idea of helping people. Life for me at the Chino County Sheriff's Department was really good. My name is Damian Welcome. In 1992, the Chatham County Sheriff's Department gave me a job offer. Anthony and I worked together at the Sheriff's Department. Anthony was always 
the consummate dresser. He was a poster boy for the sheriff's department. While Dami and Welcome and Anthony Bryan are settling into their new roles as police officers, Anthony is approached by his brother Tommy, who has a proposition for him. Tommy says he's got some off-duty police work that pays well, and he can use his brother's help. Law enforcement back then, I was making close to about $30,000 a year. So a person can make a really good supplemental living in addition to their, their regular yearly salary, um, just providing off-duty. While opportunities for off-duty gigs don't come often, Tommy hooks his brother up with one. We met at a local park. He expressed to me about some individuals from Miami and they had these shipments of diamonds and our job was to escort them to the warehouse and provide 24-hour security. This particular off-duty scenario paid like $1,000 or $1,200. Everything sounds good to Anthony, so he agrees to do it. But on the day of the job, Anthony learns that Tommy didn't quite tell him everything. When my brother first approached me, he expressed to me that these were diamonds that we were supposed to be guarding. But before we began, it switched from diamonds to now drugs. Guarding diamonds as an off-duty cop is one thing but guarding illegal drugs is something completely different, and it gives Anthony pause. When I was eventually told that it was drugs, that shifted my paradigm for a minute in the sense of uh, this is some heavy stuff, but we don't have to see anything, touch anything, and met about 27 years old, I just thought it was a great opportunity and, and made the choice and made the decision to, to um, partake in that. The job goes down, and for Anthony, the role of police escort is an easy fit. My only job was escort them to their warehouse. They would be parked at a hotel. I would come with my patrol car and follow behind them. That way, no one else can stop them because the police is behind them. After the first run, the other runs become easier. A few months go by and Anthony and Tommy continue guarding shipments of drugs. But what they believe to be a secret side gig has actually been compromised without their knowledge. Things are about to get real tricky. When you make these decisions and choices, uh, you just don't think about the consequences. Tommy Bryan has been doing this work for months. He first learns about this opportunity from a man he thinks is a local crook. But what he doesn't know is their conversations are being recorded. Tommy is discussing selling illegal guns across state lines. What Tommy Bryant doesn't realize is that this same man he's been working with has been reporting all the illegal transactions to the FBI because he is actually a convicted felon turned informant. After about a year of surveillance and reports by the Savannah FBI office, they realize it's time to turn the operation up a notch and bring in an undercover agent. I was an FBI agent for 24 years. I was born in the Bronx, New York, spent eight and a half years in the Air Force and in the, the Bureau call. Tony Lopez was my undercover name for my entire undercover career. Your persona, or my persona, is what it is. I changed very little, okay? The way to stay alive in this game, literally, okay, is to stay as close to the truth as possible. 
Tony gets the call and the job is clear. He needs to infiltrate a dangerous group of rogue cops in Savannah, Georgia. It was 93 or 94. I get contacted by somebody from the Undercover and Sensitive Operations Unit. He tells me about this case in the Savannah FBI office, the number of violations. From the information that I read, there were several police officers in Savannah that had provided uh, guns, drugs to an informant. That investigation had reached the, the point where they wanted to uh, inject an undercover to elevate the integrity of the evidence collection. In the case of the Savannah operation, it was a drug sting with police officers. So I was a drug trafficker. We trafficked cocaine around the United States. All undercover investigations are dangerous, but when cops break the law, it puts the entire community and undercover agents in more danger. And with these rogue cops allegedly selling drugs and weapons, Tony needs to watch his step if he wants to find out how deep the corruption goes. One false move, and someone can easily get killed. The name of the operation was Broken Oath. One of the objectives that we initially wanted to determine was if Tommy Bryant was working with any other law enforcement officers, right, that, that held the badge, that were involved in criminal activity. To make the intro, Velasquez uses an FBI informant who already has a relationship with Tommy Bryan. The informant tells Tommy that Velasquez is the brains behind a huge drug operation from Miami, and he's looking to bring the enterprise to Savannah. But when I'm introduced to Tommy Bryant by the informant, I'm introduced to somebody that's going to be bringing drugs into Savannah, and we need protection. One, two, three. It isn't long before Tommy Bryant is on Tony's payroll. Nine, two, so I tell Tommy Bryant, I want to bring cocaine into Savannah. My drivers are going to come in. I'm going to put it in a warehouse over here in, uh, by Bay Street. Tony and the FBI meticulously prepare the office, installing cameras in the walls and microphones in the furniture. And then you have to protect it. And if it's just you, that's fine. Okay, but if it's not and we can expand this, that's fine too. And then Tommy, in this case, responds and no, I have a team. And the rest of them will have to do to just show up here. But all the responsibility came to me to get the right ones to do it, the ones that I know won't say nothing. Okay, well, who's your team? And what do they look like? And there are other cops. Nineteen ninety six, Savannah, Georgia. The FBI is on to a potential corruption ring operating inside the Savannah Police Department. An undercover federal informant has already confirmed that Tommy Bryant is using his police credentials to help sell drugs and guns, collect cash, and put illegal contraband on the black market. As I understand it, Tommy Bryant had built a network and one of his members of his network was Keith Coleman. Keith Coleman is a respected officer in Savannah and the oldest brother of a prominent Savannah family. As a decorated active police officer, he's a difficult target for Tony and the FBI to investigate. Another group was led by Keith Coleman. He was probably the most aggressive and caused, at least for me, the most concern. He had all the attributes of a leader, very sharp. I mean, he was a formidable opponent. Keith Coleman, in turn, solicited me. He knew my situation. I was in the middle of a divorce and paying uh, child support. Keith Coleman tells Damien about a lucrative off-duty job he's been doing. He thinks Damien would profit from being part of it. 
but Coleman is careful not to share all of the gig's illicit details. He said, hey, I, I'm, I'm even doing off duty. And I was like, wow, really? And uh, he said, yeah. He said, and listen, it, it, you can get in on it if you want. You're going to need your badge and your gun. And I was like, okay, that's fine. The off-duty jobs start small at first. The first run, Keith Coleman told me to come with him. He said, hey, I just need you for backup. You just follow my lead. There would be a drop at the South Carolina Georgia line where we were supposed to pick up uh, a bag, which I never saw, but I was with him as he went to get it. And unfortunately for Damien, he has no clue that veteran cop Coleman is roping him into an explosive and illegal operation. He proposed it as a great opportunity to get some extra cash, uh, which definitely I could use. It never occurred to me that it was anything illegal or um, anything suspicious about it. And he didn't go into very specific detail. He just told me that I would be responsible for security. Just security is one thing, but soon Damien does more runs and the runs start to feel off. Seeds of doubt begin to creep into his mind. At some point I realized that maybe Keith was not telling me some things. Finally, during an off-duty job with Coleman, Damien sees something that isn't right and his suspicions are confirmed. We went into a house on Wilmington Island. The three beam scale in the package were presented in a living room. Nobody cut it open and spilled it on the table, but um, it, it, it didn't look right to me. I don't think Keith knew at that time, but it was a federal informant that we were talking with. And in that moment, him and Keith are having a conversation and we're just kind of sitting there. Hey, what you talking about, Keith and Brad? You know, we're bringing him, we're bringing him money and Oh, I understand. You know, no grain cocaine. Yeah. When I saw that, I should have gone straight back to internal affairs. Hey, this was sketchy. I didn't do that. I didn't. I kept my mouth shut. And uh, we never even discussed it later. We never even discussed it later. But even though he now knows it's illegal, Damien continues doing the runs just as Coleman instructs. He holds the blue wall of silence and further implicates himself in the crimes. And that was volitional. I, I, I wear that. I, I realize that. Anthony Bryan feels the same way Damien does. As cops, they can sniff out things that aren't on the up and up, but he doesn't ask any questions. Instead, Anthony keeps using his police credentials to escort illegal drugs. I did participate in two or three of these escort scenarios. What motivated me was my family and the money, knowing that it was wrong and trying to hide it. It was just really wearing on me. But for Tony, things only starting to get more complicated and intense. With two different groups of cops under surveillance, there's a lot to keep track of. And things are about to get worse. After coming in and getting involved with Keith Coleman and his group, Tommy Bryan and his group, another group emerged in the form uh, of Billy Medlock that just evolved into this you know, I mean, tornado. Billy Medlock is a highly regarded sergeant in the Savannah Police Department. He even leads the Criminal Investigation Unit and specializes in prosecuting drug crime. Given his sterling reputation, Tony is surprised when Medlock seeks him out for a meeting. Billy Medlock approached me, and at some point, him and I had a conversation that I'm bringing cocaine into Savannah and I got a warehouse. If you can escort it in and guard it, then we can make a deal. When Medlock, the cop with a good reputation, actively wants to participate in illegal drug smuggling, the FBI is shocked by the widespread corruption in Savannah. 
Within a few months, the undercover operation has revealed three separate groups of cops willing to help traffic drugs across state lines. Operation Broken Oath is turning into a huge case for the FBI. Y'all yeah, could just be here at the end of the loop. Yeah, we'll be right after the loop. Right at the end of the loop, we'll pull up, flash his lights, and then you take them off. Medlock, he was a lot more ambitious than Tommy Bryant. He was a lot more aggressive than Tommy Bryant. But he seemed quite capable and, and willing to provide protective services for us to move cocaine into and out of Savannah. Billy was uh, well liked, well respected in the, uh, in, in the in the police, you know, law enforcement industry. He had the respect of everybody. My name is Ralph Frawley. I became a police officer here in Savannah in 1997. During that year, the city was experiencing a lot of uh, crimes that were associated with narcotics. I started doing uh, undercover pre-level operations, working all type of vice situations, prostitution, gambling, drugs. As a police officer, I was considered to be a crime fighter. In the uh, Criminal Investigations Bureau, CIB, Billy Medlock was my direct supervisor and mentor as a police officer. I was, according to him, confident, fast, follow his lead and back him up. We had an appreciation for one another and became close. One day at the office, Sergeant Billy Medlock approaches his right-hand man, Ralph Riley, and tells him he has a problem. He came up to me one day in the office He's like, uh, hey, look, man, I, I, you know, I'm in a tight spot. I, I need you to, to help me out with this off-duty job. He says, hey, I, you know, I need you to, to go with me to the Florida-Georgia line to escort these folks. They got these diamonds. Sergeant Billy Medlock is Ralph Riley's supervisor and mentor on the police force. What Medlock orders, Riley does. No questions asked. Riley has no way of knowing that answering this call from his superior officer will change the course of his life forever. He said, but you know, we're gonna have to get there because I'm behind. I said, okay, well, no problem. So we hightail it down there to Jacksonville and the people weren't there. Apparently he missed it. He's like, uh, I'm, I'm gonna take care of you because you know you, you came out here, you stopped doing what you was doing. He gives me 300 bucks. And I'm like, hey, next time you need me to do this, just let me know. $300, I'll go for it. Just like the other two ringleaders, fellow cops Tommy Bryan and Keith Coleman, Medlock doesn't reveal that this is actually an illegal enterprise. It wasn't nothing out of the ordinary about this particular job when he, you know, gave me the spill about it. Medlock starts Riley off small. He asks him to watch the warehouse and provide security on a few occasions. But soon, the jobs escalate. When we sit there and we just watch that warehouse. But then from it being watching the warehouse, it turned into escorting people who possess the diamonds from point A to point B. After a few jobs, Riley starts to notice that his mentor and superior isn't acting like himself. Going back, you know, at that time, he is not the same. Whatever's going on is made Medlock not Medlock anymore. What Riley can't put his finger on is that his boss, Billy Medlock, is starting to run scared. Don't think I haven't had those thoughts when you check the toilet. I mean, big DA agents from there. Rumors started circulating that there was a, a, an FBI undercover operation in Savannah. And then Medlock says, hey, where are you? Meet me over here. My spider senses went off.
FBI agent Tony Velasquez is deep undercover, investigating an intricate web of corrupt cops in the Savannah Police Department. He's getting close to bringing down the operation when one of the targets of the investigation, Sergeant Billy Medlock, starts to get suspicious. And he was in uniform in his patrol car. I'm like, what? Why are we in an alley? And he said, get in. And I was really uncomfortable because no one knew where I was. And I'll never forget because he's sitting in the patrol car and he's got his revolver right here. He said, I just want to make sure everything's straight. He seemed suspicious and concerned. The message to me was, look, man, I hope you say, you know, you are who you say you are. Do they think if they're getting suspicious that you're an informant or an undercover? Okay. And we've had informants killed in these operations. If he decides to do something, am I going to try to wrestle him for his gun? Or am I going to try to, you know, get out the car? And, and, and so I'm going through this and I settled on, on the gun because you're not going to be able to get out of that car in time. Luckily, Tony is a veteran undercover and has been trained in stressful situations like this. He expertly calms Medlock down and convinces him there's nothing to worry about. We negotiated that, the transition out of the conversation, but I got out and then we continued, you know, having discussions about the operation. We agree on numbers. Medlock, you're gonna get three and I'm gonna give you guys two. And you come in after we're done and the couriers take the, the drugs out and then we'll pay. Ben Locke was like, I'm picking up the money and I'm paying everybody. And if you don't like it. Tony has no choice but to accept Medlock's conditions. But this causes a problem for the FBI. Because Medlock controls all interactions with Tony, the FBI can't prove that Riley and Holmes are knowingly participating in criminal activity. So now the challenge becomes, we got to establish that Riley and Holmes know what's going on. So the FBI hatches a plan to get the evidence they need. I had a, an apartment out on Tybee Island outside of Savannah, and we decided we were going to have a barbecue. I would invite Medlock, Holmes, Riley, boom. Then somebody on the investigative team would devise a way to get Medlock called away. And it worked. The only problem is he took Riley with him. So I just had Holmes. He immediately starts to complain. Man, we gotta get start getting paid more money. And I'm, I'm like, oh, oh. I said, You're com what are you complaining about? I think we should be getting more. I said, you don't think two is, is enough? No, I don't think it's enough. You don't think $2,000? He goes, we're supposed to be getting $2,000? Now, you know, yeah. The, the balloon goes up, right? This guy has no idea what he's doing. And Medlock's at him. Tony is surprised to learn this and pushes to see what else he can get out of Holmes. What about Riley? Yeah, he's paying Riley $200. So you're telling me every time you guys do one of these things, you get $200 a day? Yeah. What do you think you're doing? What did he tell you you were protecting? He said, diamonds. I said, Holmes, look. You're a cop. Do I look like a diamond dealer? I have no diamonds. Man, I said, it's not diamonds. It's cocaine. And he, you know, it's like the, his soul just went out, you know, fainted, and then came back in. And he's like, we got to tell Riley. So now we know that Riley and Holmes don't know. Holmes is now caught in a dangerous place. He's just found out that his sergeant, Billy Medlock, has been lying to him and Ralph Riley. They have been escorting shipments of cocaine into Savannah. Now that Holmes knows the truth, he needs Riley to know also. But he's afraid that Riley won't believe him. 
So he asked Tony to tell him directly. Mike and I are alone together, which is weird because he ain't my friend. And he was like, uh, you ever talk to Tony? No. Uh, I think you need to talk to Tony. About what? He said, nah, don't, don't tell Billy about it. But, but I think you need to know what's really going on. I said, okay. All right, you got my you got my attention. Let's let's talk to Tony and find out what's really going on. Officer Ralph Riley's mentor and supervisor. Billy Medlock has been lying to him about a series of illegal off-duty jobs that Medlock has been running. He's also been cheating Riley out of money. We meet up with Tony at his office. So Mike says, Tony, tell him what you told me. What the total amount he paid Billy out of last round? 14, 1400. <laughs> Fourteen grand. How much did you give you? Then you can run. It ain't your fault, Tony. That's why we're talking. You know what these people are doing. Then another thing is, shit, he told some diamonds and shit. You know what I'm saying? That shit's cocaine. I'm not better than those gold. Shit, you can get it. You know from the beginning. I said, man, are you really serious? Medlock knows that this whole time we've been guarding cocaine and he's been telling us his diamonds. And really, I mean, I end up pissed off by the money, man. But it's just a principle. It's a principle. Yeah, it's a principle. I mean, it's a principle. Really, I mean, I ain't, I'm not really pissed off. I just feel sorry, man. It is stuff I thought that I mean, this could be cool. That relationship between Riley and Medlock was one of a mentor, one of a surrogate father. He looked up to Medlock. He was devastated. It hadn't processed what was really going on and how Medlock f***ed him. He's like, I'm sorry and shit. He take care of us. That makes me a play, really. You didn't know it was cocaine, right? Okay, then this is what you do. Walk out that door. We didn't know this shit was cocaine. If this is gonna be a hurdle, or a wall, and if this is the end, I'm cool. The FBI has just given Riley and Holmes an out, one that could save them from serving prison time for corruption. He's not even listening to what I'm saying at this moment, right? He's just trying to accept or absorb what has been going on and what he's going to do. I say it, it, ain't, it ain't about you, uh, Tony. It's about me and this guy. Yeah, we don't need to bring Tony in. It's just between me and me. We're so close. I would, would never have uh, thought that he would betray me this way. I just thought that this man right here in my back, no matter what. I mean, I, I would have helped him, man. But I don't see that's a different story. Riley is so wounded by the fact that Medlock, a person he trusted and idolized, has betrayed him, he flies into a rage, and all he wants is revenge. He's like, F this. I want to do another deal, and I want to pick up all the money. So, to, you know, he doesn't need to tell me why, because now Medlock would know that he knows. Riley's obsession with getting revenge has blinded him. And instead of getting out of illegal activity, he only gets deeper. He made, in my opinion, a very poor decision based on, solely based on emotion. The sensation of one revenge and wanting to get even clouds your senses, clouds your judgment. And that's the reason why I stayed in. I stayed in to get Medlock. After their meeting with Tony, Riley and Holmes put their plan into action. They'll do a security escort for what they believe are drug shipments, but instead of getting paid by Medlock, they'll collect the money directly from Tony. 
we do the deal. This time, Riley picked up the money. This time for Tony, things feel more dangerous than before. Medlock doesn't know about his deal, so when he shows up to collect his money, there's no telling what could happen. Tony has to prepare for anything. This was the only time I had a gun in the operation. So I had a gun, I put it in the sofa on the side where I was sitting. And Medlock comes in, he's like, hey, so yeah, man, I'm, I'm running, whatever he said, I gotta go and, you know, we're acting nonchalant. I'm like, oh no, right, Riley already came and picked it up. Ronnie came in here and said they had to go to court, so. And he just starts shaking his head, says, no, no. That ain't how it's supposed to work. Look, man, I, I, I don't understand why this would be a problem. He's on your team, right? If that don't work, I guess you know, right? Medlock went into shock because he now knows, Riley knows what's going on. This is a huge, devastating knockout blow for Medlock. There's no way to recover from this for him. He's the one that I look out for. He knows that we don't operate like that. So he said, no, man, it's not how it's supposed to work. Look, I don't know what to tell you. And we got other shit to do, so, you know, let me know. And then he leaves. Operation Broken Oath is getting more complicated and heated. Along with police corruption and illegal drug trafficking, there are now two officers seeking revenge through violence. The stakes are real and dangerous. Then Holmes, I think, calls me and says, Riley has a shotgun. He's going to go kill Medlock. Officer Ralph Riley and Mike Holmes are on their way to confront Billy Medlock with what they now know. Medlock has tricked them into providing security for cocaine, not diamonds, and has been paying them only 10% of the actual buy-in. We met him in a parking lot. I bought a 12-gauge uh, pistol grip shotgun and I had put it in the, the door on the driver's side of the car. If he tried to get aggressive, anything like that, he was gonna get it. He was regretful, he was apologizing. Um, he was even pleading that he didn't know, still lying. It is with us walking away and knowing that we're mortal enemies now. He is not going to let this go. He is going to get me back for this. He's going to try to do something to me. After finding out about Medlock's betrayal, Put a total of my he paid Billy a dollar ass run. Holmes also gets angry, but instead of going after Medlock directly, he makes a different choice. After the meeting, Holmes went to the DEA and he says, I got, you know, Tony Lopez. I didn't know it was drugs. You know, Billy Mendel, he just name it everybody in Savannah, right? So they wire up Holmes. So he thinks he's working undercover now. He still thinks I'm a drug dealer. So the subsequent meetings, he's got a wire on, I have a wire on, right? What started out as a drug sting to nab road cops has quickly escalated into a potentially violent confrontation. It's not something Tony and the FBI could see coming, and they need to do damage control. After that scenario, Bureau's like, we can't control what was going to happen between Riley and Medlock. That risk was just, it was a bridge too far. Our undercover operations have, you know, proposals that are written with, you know, timelines, 
objectives and once those objectives are reached unless new ones emerge that's when we take it down so i think those two elements just happen to coincide it seems like operation broken oath is about to get taken down they had devised a plan to have the officers come in and as they came in they were arrested I was on night shift at Precinct 4, and the watch commander would say, there are gonna be some police officers arrested tonight. If they don't have anything to do with you, stay out of the way. I blew it off. About two in the morning, I heard that knock on the door, that six, that six knock rap. I knew at that time in the morning, it could be nothing good. The lieutenant, he wants me to get in his car. He's got the clipboard and he wants me to focus on this clipboard and write down these points. So I'm like, man, really, this is what we're doing right here? And Sergeant Edwards says, yeah, and they got that Coleman boy. When I heard that, my stomach dropped. At that moment, I was almost physically ill because I knew the association I had with him. All of a sudden, on the passenger side of the door, the door is snatched open. I draw my weapon, pointed out the, the door. And then the Lieutenant says, Riley, that's the FBI. And uh, please put the gun down. They're here to arrest you. I don't want you to get shot. I don't want you to shoot them, that kind of thing. My FTO gets a call, signal 13. That means go back to precinct. You know, we don't make small talk or anything as we head back. Our heart's racing. It's just a solemn moment. I get to precinct four and it's completely dark which was odd. The FBI come through that door at the time. I knew that it was Tony and that it was a sting operation. And uh, I said, oh man, this is over. I said, you're gonna have to plead guilty. There's no way you can beat this case. The FBI says they began their investigation after years of complaints about corrupt police officers. After using undercover agents from other states and a local convicted felon, 11 officers were nabbed and charged with federal drug offenses. Sitting in his cell and realizing he's been caught up in an undercover sting, there is only one person Riley wants to talk to. And the FBI told me Riley's cooperating on one condition that you come back and talk to him. And so the bureau flew me down and I talked to him. Riley said, look, I just wanted to let you know that this is not who I am. And I go, look, I know I, I was there. So I know what happened. I, I saw the movie and I've probably seen it a hundred times because I got a copy of the videotape. This is cocaine. All of Savannah would soon see the videotapes that Tony and the FBI had gathered as evidence against the police officers. One by one, shackled current and former police officers make their way into the federal courthouse on Bull Street. Then, several hours later, investigators describe in detail the offenses that put the men behind bars. Police Chief David Gallantly says this is a sad day for his force. He commented and refused all media questions. In 1997, nearly a dozen Savannah police officers are arrested on drug charges as part of a year-long FBI sting operation. Eleven officers in all were indicted by a federal grand jury for various offenses, including escorting drug couriers in and out of the Savannah area. The FBI has built a strong case and the accused former officers need to decide if they take their chances in court or try to make a plea deal with the feds. Riley cooperates, so the way that works is 
the government will give you a sentence and reduction. And typically, the rule of thumb is just one third off. Anthony Bryant and Damian Welcome also strike plea agreements. During the three-hour hearing, the defendants admit their guilt in exchange for having several other charges dropped. Anthony K. Bryant pled guilty, also confessing to undercover drug deals as 32-year-old Ralph Riley and 27-year-old Damien Welcome. When I was still before that judge, he said, Mr. Bryant, I'll now sentence you to 148 months in a federal prison. I was like, that's 12 years. I got sentenced to eight years. Got nine years. Everybody wants to do the right thing. But everybody doesn't. But not all the indicted officers decide to plea. At that time, my brother wanted to, to take his chances on the trial in, in, in hopes that, you know, 12 jurors can see, you know, his point of view. With his family supporting him, Keith Coleman also decides to go to trial. I was surprised that they went to trial with the quality of that evidence in the form of conversations that were recorded and videotaped, but they did. A jury finds Thomas Bryant Jr. guilty of federal drug charges. Thomas Bryant Jr. was sentenced to life in prison. He was convicted of recruiting other officers into the drug ring in addition to guarding shipments. Keith Coleman also received a life sentence for the same conviction. Billy Medlock, the former police sergeant, was given a 22 and a half year prison sentence, but it could have been worse. After numerous appeals over decades, Keith Coleman is released in June 2020 after serving 22 years in federal prison. But Anthony Bryant's brother Tommy remains in prison with nearly 20 years remaining on his sentence. I've kept up with most of the guys through their incarceration, including uh, Tommy Bryant, who is the last of the people who are incarcerated 24 years later. No one should go to prison for the rest of their lives in a case like this. This is just wrong for America. I've visited Tommy quite a few times since I've been released. He's now fighting to be released based upon sentencing restructures that, that, are, that are taking place now. So I'm just really wishing that um, he can come home soon. Right is right, no matter if nobody is doing it. And wrong is wrong, no matter if everybody is doing it. You have to weigh those options and, and just count the cost. Um, and once you count the cost, I think ethically, it, that, that'll resonate with, with most people to, to, to say, wow, um, it's not worth it. Th this is not worth it. 